Thank you very much, Emily. Thank you very much, New York University, and generally all those organizers who arranged this uh, tour. Thank you for ev to everyone who uh, is listening to this uh, presentation. Uh, I'm myself uh, really honored to be in front of you because uh, Generally, we started to prepare this tour several years ago, but due to the COVID, due to the pandemic and many other things, it was postponed several times. But finally, I'm seeing your faces and I'm, uh, uh, I'll be discussing some issues which might be interesting for you. Uh, today, we decided to talk about the Central Asian literature in the world context. Uh, and in order to make it less uh, kind of theoretical uh, or conceptual, uh, I'll be based, so it will be based mostly on my own experience maybe, and uh, I'll try to tell the story of the Central Asian literature through my books as well, wherever it's possible, because uh, uh, with the age, all of a sudden, I'm starting to realize that uh, the history of the Central Asian literature affects my writing enormously. So, uh, therefore, uh, the title, as you've seen, is that one. So let's start from the very beginning. I mean, uh, you must be uh, aware of the Central Asia, but at least you could, uh, if not studied, but uh, uh, I'm sure that you are aware of Central Asia. But just to set up uh, the whole Central Asian scene, uh, Central Asia, as you know, uh, consists of mostly uh, two types of people, nomadic and sedentary. There were Turkic tribes who came to Central Asia who were living there, and the sort of sedentary Sogdian, Parthian, and so on and so forth. Uh, tribes there, so, uh, uh, which mixed up and created modern Central Asia. But in terms of storytelling, in terms of literature, these uh, particular uh, features or uh, traits, for example, they are very, very deeply inbuilt in Central Asia. And for example, when you compare the Kazakh storytelling to the Uzbek one or to Tajik one, they are quite different to each other. Though uh, those people lived uh, uh, along uh, uh, together for many, many, many uh, 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 hundreds of years. So let's start from the sort of, you know, from the mostly is since uh, the language is Turkic in Central Asia, let's concentrate on Turkic uh, literary tradition, which starts with the early Turkic inscriptions, sixth century uh, uh, of uh, sort of, uh, of, uh, yeah, sixth century, uh, for time, seventh century. So they are mostly in uh, Mongolia, in Altai, those inscriptions. Uh, and what interesting with these inscriptions, I, apart from the sort of, you know, early Turkic tribes, the Blue Turks, so-called, or Celestial Turks, they've created a huge empire uh, uh, which extended from the sort of, you know, the uh, Pacific Ocean to the uh, Mediterranean, nearly. Uh, at the same time, the most interesting character for me was the sort of, that these tribes followed all the religions of the world. That was a funny moment, you know, because you can find in early Turkic uh, languages, Nestorian Christianity, you can find Islamic uh, sort of, you know, Islamic uh, artifacts or Islamic uh, manuscripts, you can find uh, Buddhist texts, you can find Manichaean texts, you can find Zoroastrian texts. So they basically fold all the religions of the world, including also Judaism as well, because, you know, the Khazars later uh, followed this uh, religion. So that open was uh, something very interesting to me. What made them follow all these religions? And I tried to, uh, you know, fictionalize it in my book, uh, which was published uh, under the pseudonym. 
uh, which is called Hostage to Celestial Turks. I would refer you to this book, which uh, deals exactly with this issue. Why Turks followed all the religions of the world? What made them to uh, follow all these religions? And what was the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the outcome of it? That Then uh, Central Asia develops towards the sort of Islamic route, mostly Islamic route. And in Islam, Central Asia is playing a key role because uh, the first book of uh, uh, Islam is Quran which is given uh, as uh, it uh, uh, sort of perceived by God to uh, Prophet Muhammad but the second book is the Sunnah uh, and the Hadiths and the biggest and the most famous hadiths are collected, uh, sort of, you know, the sayings of Prophet and uh, uh, situations from his life are collected by uh, uh, Bukhari, Al Bukhari, who was from Bukhara, from Central Asia. And he is revered as the biggest, uh, you know, uh, uh, person in Islam. So the philosophy, Islamic philosophy, also flourished in uh, Central Asia. Generally, uh, Europe uh, owes, uh, you know, Central Asians, the sort of, you know, the passage of the Greek philosophy onto Europe. People like Al-Farabi, who was born in Central Asia, people like Ibn Sina, they were the transporters of this, uh, you know, of this Greek knowledge into the modern world, uh, into the Europe. So their translations of the Greek uh, philosophy was the kind of, uh, you know, initiations of the modern uh, philosophy. So once again, uh, in one of my books uh, of strangers and bees, uh, I'm trying to show the life of the Ibn Sina, one of the polymaths of, uh, of uh, Central Asia. Then uh, there is this element of Sufism in Central Asia. Uh, Sufism uh, is seen as a sort of, you know, mystical uh, uh, movement which overcomes the sort of the, the religion, you know, which unites. Uh, there are theories that, for example, uh, Kabbalism of Judaism, Sufism of Islam, mysticism, Gnosticism of uh, Christianity, they are similar to each other in a way. Uh, they are thinking about the uh, perfection of the uh, of the uh, individual uh, sort of you know direct connection between individual uh, with god without any formalities which are sort of inbuilt in sharia in this and that so uh, another view which uh, I'm always thinking about why, uh, for example, Central Asia became the uh, land of flourishing Sufism, because we've got the, from the mother schools, several mother schools of Sufism based in Central Asia, like, for example, Kubraviya, Yasaviya, Naqshbandiya, Qadriya, all of them, they are coming out of Central Asia. And it seems to me that one of the explanations why uh, Sufism flourished in Central Asia, uh, every world religion in a way needs to be adapted to the needs of certain people. In a way, you know, you are not taking, for example, what has been created in Mediterranean and just sort of, you know, wearing it as your own clothes. Yeah, you have to adopt, you have to make something out of that. The same happens with uh, Christianity as well. You know, Anglicanism, for example, for English people, Protestantism in Germany and so on and so forth. So people are adopting the world religion to their own needs. Uh, and here uh, it's interesting to discuss why, for example, orthodoxy of Russians was always sort of, you know, contentious thing for Russian mind, you know, uh, because they've taken the sort of, you know, the core of the thing, not adopting uh, for the Russianness, so called. Yeah. So it's an interesting uh, issue to discuss. But Central Asians, they've adopted uh, through their, uh, you know, all these Sufistic schools, adopted. Islam, which has been created in the steppes of, uh, in the uh, deserts of uh, Saudi, to their own needs, in their own form, adapted uh, to, to their own culture in a way. So that adaptation was uh, the, uh, through uh, Sufi uh, uh, 
Sufi schools like, for example, Ahmad Yassavi in that case. So I'm talking about that one specifically in the railway. There are moments uh, which are devoted to this school particularly. In fact, uh, the railway, I started the railway as a novel about Yassavi. And I started it in Uzbek, but uh, one of uh, the, uh, one of the Uzbek writers told me you would never publish because the Soviet uh, during the Soviet Union Yasavi was persona non grata. You know, you couldn't uh, talk about religion, you couldn't talk about Sufism, and so on and so forth. Then the railway turned into something else. Then uh, Central Asia develops into the Timurid period uh, of uh, after the uh, you know uh, Genghis Khan uh, uh, conquered the whole, uh, half of the world. Then Tamburlaine the Great came uh, to do the same. So he is from Samarkand, from Central Asia, and uniting the world, uniting different cultures under the Timurid uh, culture, once again helped to uh, sort of you know to these oikumenic ideas, you know, to the, these uh, universal ideas. And one of the representatives of uh, this school is uh, Alisher Navoi, for example, the greatest, he is considered to be uh, Shakespeare of Uzbek language in a way. Unfortunately, he is not known uh, in the West, like for example, Rumi is known or Hafez is known, but he is, worth, okay, he is of the same class of the same scale. So hopefully one day uh, people, especially young people who are living here, uh, will be translating him uh, accordingly. Uh, that time is the time of Babur as well. Babur is much more famous than Navoi because of his Babur Name, uh, the, uh, his diaries, you know, the, the creator of the great Mongols empire in India. So, he was both uh, a creator of the empire, at the same time a poet and a writer, distinguished writer, wonderful writer. So you can read him starting from the 19th century. His books were translated in the 19th century. Uh, the last part of uh, a poet and bin Laden is talking about the, you know, about the attempts of uh, Babu Reeds, like uh, his uh, uh, grandson, um, Dara Shukuh, to unite the religions under, in India, you know, to create a sort of universal religion in a way, about his openness, but at the same time about his defeat under Aurangzeb, who was a sort of, you know, strict, strict uh, orthodox uh, person. So, uh, so before Russians, uh, uh, there was a development of all kinds of literature. Uh, I would like to just draw your attention to Nishati, who wrote a wonderful novel, which is, uh, when you uh, examine it, it's very, very interesting. So basically, uh, in the... Uh, uh, realm of body and mind, a child is born. A child uh, is born and the child's name is Heart. Heart. And when the, the, the Fuad or Heart uh, gets sort of, you know, the, uh, uh, adulthood, 18 years, so his uh, father gives him the sort of, you know, the uh, realm of body, and his mother is giving him a book. And the book is about the uh, source of the life, you know, eternal source of the life, like Holy Grail, basically. Yeah. Uh, and he, uh, he, uh, he falls in love with, the, with this book and he is asking his uh, servant, whose name is Nazar. Nazar is a site sight, eyesight. So to go and to look for this uh, uh, source of uh, eternity. And Nazar goes like your eyesight goes through the lines of your of the book, yeah. So Nazar goes to the world to search for the uh, for the for the uh, uh, source of the life. 
and whatever he needs for example you know he needs uh, he goes to the uh, mm -hmm. hope he goes to all human faculties basically and uh, can't find uh, this source of life ultimately he finds this source of love uh, life uh, from love and there are sort of fightings and so on and so forth. What I'm trying to say here, what happens in front of your eyes is happening in the book, yeah? And book, uh, the microcosm and the uh, macrocosm are united in this book, as if he is sort of, you know, leading you through a psychological exercise, you know? So but the, uh, if you're wondering, for example, what will happen next, so it means that in the book you are in the uh, castle of wonder, let's say, yeah? So basically he manipulates your mind in this book, uh, leading you through all human faculties. And it's a fantastic book which could be read like a sort of, you know, psychological manual, like anything, like tricking you into something and so on and so forth. So as a storytelling, it's a fantastic thing. Uh, I have translated it into Russian uh, when I was young. So uh, it's, it's possible to read it in Russian. Unfortunately, there is no... Uh, Uzbe uh, there is no English version of it. Russian conquest, then uh, Central Asia, what happens in Central Asia, the, you know, Soviet period and Russian conquest. Here, I would like to turn our attention to, uh, you know, what, uh, so during the Russian time, what has happened to the literatures? Though the Soviet Union announced the friendship of uh, people, uh, sort of the uh, common uh, Soviet uh, nation and so on and so forth, but when you are analyzing uh, literature, starting from the founding father of uh, social realism from Maxim Gorky, you realize that all novels are mono-ethnic. For example, I just uh, gave the main characters of uh, Gorky's mother, yeah? You can see that all of them, they are Russians. Let's go further. Tolstoy, Cloudy Morning, the same, yeah? All characters are Russians. Let's go to Vasily Grossman, Life and Fate. So nearly everyone is Russian. Yes, Viktor Strum is a Jewish character, but the rest are Russians, yeah? Russians, 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 generally. Maybe so Sophia Levinton is Jewish and a couple of... Uh, so basically, uh, it's monoethnic. Solzhenitsyn, uh, cancer, cancer ward, once again. Though cancer ward is happening in Tashkent, in Uzbekistan. It's set up in Uzbekistan. But yet, all the sort of, you know, Otar uh, Chiladze, Let's take uh, not Russian literature, but Georgian, for example. Yeah, since we're ordering uh, Georgian food, look. Vacha, Kusa, Malano, Farnaos, Aeta. So, okay, uh, Georgia was uh, mostly uh, mono ethnic, let's say. But let's go to Kazakhstan, which was half uh, sort of, you know, the Russian speakers were in majority. Once again, we're taking a novel, Yadigir, Azim, Bakizat, RLC, Baikanur side, everything is to do with, uh, even there in Baikonur side, everything is to do with Kazakhs. No Russians, let's say, leave alone others. Uzbek novel, once again. So, <laughs> but whereas the makeup of the Soviet Union was like that, yeah? Uh, let's say, uh, in the beginning of the uh, Russian literature, for example, Platonov, he was open, for example, you know, in his John, he brings all the sort of diversity of the world. But where this diversity goes, I analyzed my street of my childhood, yeah, which I consider to be traditionally Uzbek one. Have a look. Kola, Ukrainian, Kobol, Uyghur, Balta, Vera, they are mixed, one Uzbek, one Russian, my granny Uzbek, Murzin, Mardva, Fathullah, Tajik, Saimulin, Chuvash, Reuter, German, Izia, Jew, uh, Ravil, Tatar, Moshe, Belarusian, Pak, Korean, Yusuf, Bukharian Jew, Jabi, Iranian, Logan of Russian. That is one street, you know, one street. But the literature about all of that, when I came to the West, I thought it would be different. Once again, 
uh, take the sort of Ian McEwan's atonement, for example, famous one, yeah? All English. Even Kazuo Ishiguro, <laughs> never let me go. All English. So where is, for example, once again, my street, Cromer Road, yeah, my cul-de-sac in London. Look, Sue and Russell, Jew and English, Flora Keith, West Indies, Shana and Stewart, Iranian <laughs> English, Nancy, her father, Pakistanis, Pauline Derek, English, uh, <laughs> Charlie Ruby, Indians, Chunk, and so on and so forth. So where is this uh, sort of, you know, diversity in the literature? And is it just the sort of, you know, the case with the Soviet literature or generally is literature racist and nationalistic by nature? Uh, when you start to think about that, you understand that language is one of the main markers of belonging to a certain nation. Yeah. So language uh, makes us belonging to Uzbek, uh, to this and that. Literature is one of the main customers and servants of certain language. Then language and literature is one of the main elements of certain culture and tradition so literature appeals to certain people speaking the same language and living the same cultural tradition so aren't we recreating by literature the sort of presumptuous world you know of mono ethnicity and mono nationality in a way yeah why literature is doing all of what the that so doesn't it do uh, the things like creates narratives of belonging to certain identity, enhances and develops the existing uh, traditions, which might be seen as prejudices, you know, as uh, collective prejudices. Uh, in best cases, uh, you see, it breaks those prejudices and replace, uh, replaces with new ones, like Goethe did in Sorrows of Young Werther, Tolstoy in Anna Karenina, Kafka in Metamorphosis, Nabokov in Lolita, and so on and so forth, but creates new, maybe, uh, prejudices. So, and when you are looking into all this issue of uh, the role of the literature creating prejudices, yes, for example, in the 19th century, the literature was much more open. Uh, uh, read, for, uh, for example, Jules Verne, yeah? So you can meet lots of different people uh, in this literature. So now with the sort of, you know, place, could it be applied to the anti-migrant narrative applied to literature? Uh, since we are talking about the place of uh, Central Asian literature in, uh, uh, in the West, so let's try. Uh, what are the main prejudices against migrants in, the, in our lives, yeah? So what we are usually saying, Others we believe to be less than us, yeah? Usually the, the sort of, you know, anti-migrant feelings start with this, uh, that one. Uh, like in Russia, they are saying in Moscow, Panayekhali. So the same attitude exists among the sort of, you know, the uh, uh, people that, uh, who own the place. More interested in, in taking our resources, that is one prejudice that uh, they are coming here to uh, sort of eat up what uh, we need eat. More likely to cheat us in exchanges, they are coming here, we're not going there to violate our Norman values. In Russia, they are saying that half of the, uh, the crimes are committed by migrants. To take more than uh, their fair share, they are taking took everything, carry different pathogens within their bodies, and so on and so forth. Could you apply the same uh, uh, sort of yeah uh, when prejudices are overcome? Uh, when the, the people start to understand that they are not actually posing the threats, the migrants, they begin to uh, adopt the norms and the practices of their new homes, uh, becoming one of us, as they are saying, begin to form friendship across the group lines, like I used to hear, for example, you know, in Moscow, you are not of them, but we're talking about, uh, let's say, other Uzbeks, let's say, not about you, you are one of us, kind of. So uh, we share something important and trust them. So are those prejudices applicable to foreign literature? For example, my own experience, I wrote the underground, yeah, and there was 
uh, one criticist, one Russian criticist, uh, wrote uh, a very, very sort of, you know, full of praise, uh, review full of praise. But it starts like that. Живущий в Лондоне иммигрант из Узбекистана, Хамид Исмайлов, написал на русском роман Боба, который показал, чем мог быть русский постмодернизм 21 века. Но чем он не стал, а случился банальнее и ничтожнее. On the first uh, sort of, you know, side, it seems that he's praising, yeah? But you can feel all these sort of, you know, uh, kind of uh, chauvinistic idea behind of that, yeah? Who is this, uh, this person, uh, the author? He lives in London, which is uh, against all the sort of, you know, ex uh, 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 acceptances. He is uh, emigre, he is from Uzbekistan, and he is still writing in Russian. So everything he uh, is sort of, you know, making you suspicious of this person, isn't it? So, <laughs> or for example, we must admit that there is great literature beyond the one written in English. Very often we hear that as a translated writers, yeah? Very often we hear that. So strategies uh, to have overcome foreignness in my migrant literature. So some people are writing in their own languages, yes? Yeah? There are different strategies. Some people could write in their own languages in order to, or asking to be translated, not asking, but uh, sort of yeah, they they be being translated, like uh, Ismail Kadare, like Solzhenitsyn. They are achieving something in their own languages, and because of that, they are translated. Uh, some people are starting to change their attitudes, you know, specifically. Like, for example, later Aitmat have tried to please the Western audiences with all kinds of concepts like parity, like uh, Hollywoodization of his books and so on and so forth. So uh, some people are finding, uh, writers are finding a specific niche. For example, Timur Pulatov, who is a very, very uh, uh, talented uh, uh, Uzbek writer who, Russian, uh, who uh, writes in Russians, Russian, he became the advocate of Crimean Tatar issue, for example. Uh, so all his books are translated now in Crimean Tatar and so on and so forth. Other strategy is from the very beginning to start as one of them, yeah? To become purely mainstream writer. Cases of Nabokov, of Naipaul, or Ishiguro, or Kundera, who decided to write not in uh, Czech, for example, but in French, yeah? Mm. Uh, and they are writing about the sort of situation around them. Others write in English and European languages about their stories, ethnic stories, but in English. Like, for example, uh, Hosseini, who is writing about the uh, Afghanistan, but in English, yeah, with all English uh, sort of, you know, strat uh, strategies of writing. Elif Shafak, uh, Matar Rahimi uh, in France. So there are different strategies to overcome them, uh, sort of, you know, uh, to become part of the mainstream literature in the West basically, uh, what I'm trying to say. And hybrid cases like Joseph Brodsky. He used to write, for example, poetry mostly in Russian until the end of his uh, life, but uh, he wrote extensively essays in, uh, in uh, English, which are wonderful. Uh, so share of translated literature. Look, so uh, US is unfortunately, you know, 3% of all published books are translated books. Uh, Spain, every fourth book. Uh, in Poland, every third book is translated is translated. So different countries, you, you can see the attitude yeah, here. Uh, when we are looking sort of, you know, another visual. So once again, you can see the visuals uh, so where in uh, Baltic states, for example, you can see Sweden, Finnish, 50% are translated books. So basically the countries are much open, you know, to otherness. 
in their sort of, you know, literary per perception. Whereas, as I'm saying, in the United States, uh, shamefully, it's only 3% of uh, uh, literature. Yesterday, I went in Yale to one of the uh, bookshops. I couldn't find any book of Orhan Pamuk, of Andrei Kurkov, of uh, any sort of, you know, famous writers who, who are translated. So everything was about hours, hours, hours. So, uh, look, the figures I uh, analyzed, uh, so between uh, 2000 and 2012, how many? So uh, you remember how Donald, uh, uh, what, what, what his name, the unknown knowns, known knowns, the Minister of Defense. Yeah, yeah, so thank you. So <laughs> he said about sort of, you know, known unknowns and unknown unknowns. We would, uh, in the West, we would like to sort of, you know, uh, uh, translate something digestible, yeah, something familiar to us, easy sort of, you know, digestible things. For example, uh, French uh, is the most translated into English, German is the second, Spanish is the third, Russian is the fourth Swedish is uh, unproportionately sort of you know unproportionately represented here. Why? Because there is something un, uh, you know the snow or something uh, sort of you know gothic about that one. But at the same time, people live like us, let's say, yeah, in the West. So there is kind of uh, otherness, but otherness uh, is very close to us. Whereas from other languages, look, Urdu, for example, only 17, uh, uh, 17 books over, what, 12 years, over 12, uh, 12 years. One book, uh, or Chinese, for example, 113 books only, with the population of billion or whatever, over the billion. So we are seeing obvious parallels here between in the sort of anti-migrant uh, attitudes of the countries or societies and the publishing industry. Uh, sometimes publishing industry is even st showing stronger sort of, you know, anti-migrant sentiment. Uh, if we like, rather like those who are similar to us, as I've shown, their literature is di digestible, as I said, uh, and it's nothing to do with uh, quality of literature as such, you know, because I know uh, small literatures or representatives of small literatures who are wonderful writers, you know, you shouldn't miss them while you are living, you know, they must be read, but they are not represented, like, for example, Mesha Selimovic Bosniak. Uh, the, the dervish death is one of the classics of the 20th century. I would recommend to every school to read this book, you know, but look, uh, home office and publishing industry are acting in a similar manner or similar grounds, you know, uh, at least home offices or the Ministry of Interiors, they are giving some kind of quotas for the specialists, yeah. But here in publishing industry, no way, no way. Uh, and the question, so what to do to Central Asians? Is there any place uh, to Central Asian uh, literature in the West? So the channels which are existing, mainstream publishing, through single enthusiast translators, specialists in the areas, yes. So for example, in this country, there is a chap, Mark Rees, who decided to translate one of the best books of the Uzbek literature. It's like our uh, Gone with the Wind, yeah, for Uzbeks, uh, which is called uh, Days by Gone. So he spent 20 years of his life to translate this book. But nobody, once again, you know, knows about that and so on and so forth. Yeah, the specialists, they know, but the public doesn't know about that one. So another thing is, luckily, we have universities like yours, like other universities, which are helping to, you know, especially university presses, they've got special programs of translating either Mediterranean or South Asian or specific sort of, you know, regions uh, uh, in their curriculum. 
state-sponsored uh, programs on literary translations, uh, which are uh, sort of, you know, sponsored by the local governments. But unfortunately, as usually happens in our part of the world, the majority of uh, money is siphoned to their own sort of, you know, pockets, basically. It's one of the uh, ways of uh, laundering money, basically, uh, through that one. Uh, the result is non-existent, nearly non-existent. And publishers, uh, there are a couple of publishers uh, which are specializing on Central Asian literature. Why the Western market is so appealing? Why Central Asian writers want to be at the... Uh, First of all, obviously, financial gains, yeah? So if you're published in the West, you're paid in US dollars or in English pounds, yeah? Or, which is uh, quite uh, sort of uh, essential for writers who are uh, generally in the world, they are uh, gaining not too much, basically, for their work. Reputational gains, both internationally and nationally, uh, Distributional gains, uh, English is a global language. If you are translated into English, so you might be translated into French, into Spanish, into Togolo uh, and other languages. Mobility gains, uh, you can like walk I'm in front of you, for example. So you come to different festivals or to different tours and so on and so forth. So, which is quite attractive and global audience as well. So these are the things which are appealing to them. But are there any viable alternatives uh, how to make, for example, uh, without West, let's say. So there are bilateral literary relationships. For example, uh, there is a program of translating Uzbek books into Russian and Russian books into Uzbek, intergovernmental. But as I said earlier, the majority of these things are sort of, you know, lip services rather than uh, something else. Regional translational programs, uh, Uzbek to Kazakh, Uzbek to Kyrgyz, Kyrgyz to Tajik, and so on and so forth. Turkey, Persian, Islamic intertranslation uh, initiatives. Uh, for example, I know one of them, Cairo Sci-Fi Initiative, but it's run by a small, small NGO organization with, without resources. So all of that is showing how, uh, how uh, small other opportunities for Central Asian writers and in uh, so uh, that is the example of other writers which I have shown you know of uh, South Asian writers of African writers of all small nations writers basically yeah to be represented in the world uh, uh, literary process so why do we need uh, those voices to be heard? First of all, you know, uh, do we need uh, to hear these voices, the small cut? One argument, as I said, there are the voices, wonderful voices of uh, literary art, which we must read, one thing. Secondly, human experiences are transposable. So different nations, they uh, treat different problems differently. So especially nowadays, you know, could, uh, uh, maybe some experiences might be much more useful than others, for example. So we should be open to all experiences of humankind. But more importantly, it's about the otherness, about our human uh, sort of, you know, openness to otherness. That is the biggest problem which, I'm, which I think which is facing the humanity uh, nowadays. With what's happening, for example, in uh, uh, Ukraine now, with Russian invasion of Ukraine, when even the closest nations treat each other as the other, you know, uh, as completely sort of, you know, uh, unacceptable other. The acceptance of otherness is becoming one of the problems number one for the whole humanity. Uh, when I'm talking about otherness, I include here all kinds of otherness, religious otherness, ethnical otherness, sexual otherness, or whatever, uh, age otherness, so all kinds of otherness. But that is the theme for a completely different lecture, I think. But I would like to finish off with the one uh, sort of, you know, with the joke, uh, which is in a way explaining the attitudes here. You know, once uh, the Armenian radio was asked the question, you know, uh, could the 
children of general become the field marshal. And the uh, Armenian radio thought a bit and uh, said, no. Why? Because field marshal has got his own children. <laughs> so that is unfortunately, you know, the situation nowadays. But we are for the mobility, for the possibility of all these small literatures to be represented in the world uh, literary process. Thank you. Questions? Yes, thank you so much. I open the floor for questions. Sorry, I'll be asking you a somewhat egoistical question uh, because uh, I said it at some point this Afro Asian Writers Association, the Cold War uh, Association, besides this term as the Africa Cold War era formation, supported by the Soviet Union, with uh, very, you know, which, which meant to be. Uh, really the, the expression of the third world project in literature to diminish uh, 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 to diminish dependence on western translations and western uh, uh, and uh, on western aesthetic criteria even to uh, translate across the languages of uh, asia and africa uh, and uh, you know it flourished in a brief period of the 60s and 70s and then went into a decline. But I'm just wondering, um, you know, because it does seem to share some of the, uh, the goals and values of, uh, of uh, actually uh, championing these small literatures of uh, small non-Western non literatures. I'm, I'm just wondering if you, if you have, uh, any thoughts about this uh, historical project, you know, also, which happened to be Soviet uh, you know, whether, whether it, it uh, uh, you know, it, 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 spe it does speak to the values that, mm -hmm. that you're... Thank you, thank you. Very interesting question. So uh, one thing which uh, could it be reproduced now? Yeah, one of the questions of that one. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think it uh, could be reproduced. Why? Because uh, during the Soviet Union, it was centralized that it was funded by the sort of, you know, uh, uh, Soviet Union. There were resources which were given by the Soviet Union to uh, during the Cold War to the ideological front, let's say. Yeah, the same was here, by the way. You know, with the researchers and so on and so forth. So the centralization of the funding was one of the main things, and generally the sort of you know the uh, accountancy of that funding uh, fund, funding was quite strict one. So books were translated, books were published. I read, for example, in my youth, uh, Pakistani, for example, uh, Faiz, uh, Ahmad Faiz, for example, and others due to this program, let's say. Unfortunately, nowadays, as I'm saying, all these literary programs are becoming the way of uh, sort of corrupt, uh, corrupted ways of siphoning money into something else, you know, and unfortunately the results are non-existent. Uh, there are programs like that uh, uh, from time to, to time different uh, uh, countries. For example, last year Kazakhstan arranged the same kind of, uh, uh, you know, program to unite the sort of, you know, and even to create the alternative Nobel Prize. Yeah, but once again, Nobody knows where this money ended, you know, and where this Nobel Prize ended up, you know, the Asian or whatever. Unfortunately, that is the situation. Can I ask yes, please. I'm just curious, um, how useful a concept do you think is Central Asian literature? I mean, when you are writing, do you think, well, clearly you have in mind that kind of economic and academic structures around translation and publishing. Are you thinking of yourself as a Central Asian writer, a world writer, an Uzbek writer, like, you know, all other things equal? Um, how would you prefer to kind of categorize your uh, own writing? 
Uh, <laughs> then, you know, you have to follow how getting your sort of, you know, named by the sort of, you know, your readers and how you are accepted by other uh, uh, side, yeah? But uh, by other side, personally, I don't uh, sort of, you know, obey any of these uh, definitions, you know. I'm writing what's interesting for me. If tomorrow, there's, you know, an Indian lady who lived all her life uh, in a sort of London flat, yeah, and was listening to Radio 4 only and was doing nothing else is interested me. So I'm writing a novel about her. You know, I'm not uh, sort of, you know, it, uh, considering who is going to read it or whatever. It's a bit sort of egoistic from my side, but that is the way, uh, uh, you know, to be a writer. Uh, first of all, it's your curiosity rather than anything else, you know. It's your curiosity, it's your sort of, you know, interest, openness to otherness, all of that, yeah, all of that. So therefore, uh, I would uh, not mark myself as the uh, Central Asian or Russian or whatever. Luckily, I was blessed, uh, uh, you know, not to belong to any groups of writers. That was my blessing, you know, uh, I was very close to different groups, but never being part of them in a way but here the problem of sort of marking you yeah there is a famous once again a joke you know russian joke when uh you know uh madman apparently uh thought that he was a uh, uh, grain, you know, and was afraid of a cock uh, who sort of, you know, peck him, yeah? Uh, yeah, and he was afraid, but after the sort of therapy and so on and so forth, kind of, the, the doctor convinced him that he is not a piece of grain, yeah? And he said, okay, I'm going. But in, a, in five minutes, he was back to mad the uh, house, you know, mental house, saying, uh, there is a cock there, but you are not a grain, are you? Asked the uh, uh, doctor. He said, Yes, I know that, but uh, the cook doesn't know about that. <laughs> so that is the problem, you know, when you are marked as a Central Asian writer, so you have to follow the Central Asian writer uh, uh, obligations. Yes, please. Uh, I was wondering what, how you decide which language, I guess, to write in because I have the dead link here and I know that it was written in Russian originally. And so I'm wondering how might it have been different if you wrote it in Russian and what, how you decided the difference. That is the most difficult questions which, which I am asked to get, uh, quite often, but unfortunately I have no answer to that one. I don't know why it comes in a certain language as a package. Generally, the idea comes as a package with a certain language. I don't know why, uh, I answered several times that uh, I initially I thought that it's to do with my upbringing. For example, my family life was in Uzbek, my professional life was in Russian or in English, yeah. I thought that is maybe somehow is uh, making me to choose the language. But then I realized that I'm writing easily, for example, uh, about my professional life in uh, Uzbek, but about my family life, I'm writing in Russian. There is no logic to it. I'm still trying to crack it, and by the end of my life, hopefully, I'll crack this uh, issue, you know. Uh, but I don't know, honestly, what, why it comes in a particular language. But the second part of your question, you know, could I have written this book in Uzbek? The answer is no. I don't know, once again, why. I tried in my youth to translate my poems into uh, from language to language, yeah, and I failed miserably. There are no more questions right now from the live audience. I'll start reading some um, from the Zoom audience. The first thing is just a comment. It might be interesting and a little bit comforting to know that um, Nesha Salimovich's Death in the Dervish was the best selling translation from the Northwestern University Press series of East European novels. That series was called Writers from the Other Europe. And the book sold 5,000 copies, more than any of the other books in that series. <laughs> But to say to I mean, to answer to this comment, I mean, uh, I wish that Mesha Selimovic was uh, sold not 5,000, but 5 million. 
Um, the next question, actually the first question from Myra Mira Foreman is what was the name of the book you mentioned that everyone in the world should read? I believe it was- Yes, I was say that, as, as, a, as an example. Yeah. But there are many uh, wonderful writers in the world, you know? Uh, I mentioned uh, Otar Chiladze, for example, the Georgian one, yes. There were wonderful writers, like, for example, Ait Matov, the Kyrgyz writer, so plenty of uh, writers of small nations. Grant Motivasyan, Armenian writer, uh, Ivan Drutze, the Moldovian writer, and many, many, many others. Um, should we, Safia, would you like to ask your, we'll ask you to unmute if you'd like to ask your question. So this one will come. Um, <clears throat> hello, thank you for coming. Um, I'm one of your biggest fans, but you only have three books in English, but thank you. Um, you said that one way an author avoids racism or anti-immigrant sentiment or problems is to write in his or her own language. But um, I, my comment is that these sentiments, you know, could be inadvertently caused when the translator translates those books. You know, I'm the person who had a con uh, conversation with you about the N-word in the, the underground, <clears throat> because you didn't originally use that offensive word when you wrote that novel. But when the novel was translated and the word used was the N-word in full, you know, it did come out as racist, you know, to an American audience, you know, where the legacy of that word is quite different. So, yeah, even though you wrote, you know, you didn't write that in, in English and didn't have the intention, you know, of that, those passages being racist, in English, it comes out that way. Even, even though it was appropriate, in my opinion, because the poor little boy, you know, all his experiences. Thank you. I just wanted to add that. Thank you very much. Here we are coming to the context, you know, which should be translated. Unfortunately, as I'm saying, and as I failed as a translator, was exactly the same thing. The world and the perception of the world in different languages is completely different. So uh, one thing which could be sort of, you know, casual in one language is becoming very, very loaded in another language. So uh, therefore the context is uh, sort of, you know, the issue for the translators. Uh, and because I was always struggling with this part of the uh, uh, sort of, you know, of the issue, I decided to give up with translation at all, you know? Because sometimes it's a sort of, you know, struggle to give the same context to the same. Uh, there are different strategies here as well, like, for example, Nabokov's strategy uh, in translating uh, uh, Evgeny Onegin, giving every possible, uh, every possible sort of, you know, explanation to it. But it's... Uh, as French say, illisible, so unreadable thing uh, as a uh, matter of art, let's say. So you have to choose uh, somewhere in between, I think. So somewhere in between uh, explaining things, but at the same time expressing the things. So, uh, and I'm enormously grateful to my translators. I trust them, you know, and hopefully they are doing their bit of job uh, properly. And she's fantastic. She and I had um, a long conversation about her choice of words, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah, she, and I told her, I said, I'm not criticizing you. I just, you know, wondered because like I told you, uh, um, other authors have used that word, uh -huh. you know, and, um, you know, and she took the time to explain everything to me. And, and like I said, I thought that full use of that word was appropriate in that novel. So uh -huh. I wasn't criticizing, you know, I was just wondering because I'm starting to notice that trend in translation. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. Okay, one, another question from the Zoom audience. This one's from Sarah Dickinson, who says, thank you for this really fascinating talk. I have heard that you write in Russian more than you publish in Russian. 
I mean that sometimes the translations are published before or rather than the original Russian text. Why is that? Thank you again. I love this talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> The problem is, you know, the issue which I raised here. Basically, what I told you today is my own experience as well. I might seem as sort of, you know, as Emily introduced me, a prolific writer, a successful writer, and so on and so forth. But I am begging publishers with every new book. That is my problem, you know. I've got now four already translated books. Uh, from different languages, I mean, from Russian, from Uzbek, which I'm uh, not able to place yet uh, uh, with the publishers. That is the problem. So that is my pain, you know, which I tried to express through my presentation today. Yes. Okay, another question from Zoom chat. David Brophy asks, can you say something about the situation of writers in Uzbekistan today? and how they feel about the issues you are raising here. How do they generally conceive of their audience and their relationship to national or international literature? So they're very much, uh, they're very keen to be heard by others uh, and they're trying uh, their best to be heard by others. So a couple of uh, books of uh, modern Uzbek writers were translated into English by Christopher Ford, uh, uh, who is one of the sort of, you know, champions of Uzbek literature. He is translating, as I said, there are enthusiasts who are uh, channeling the Uzbek literature or Central Asian literature into the, into the West. Uh, so they are keen to be published here due to what I uh, said in my presentation, all these benefits to be heard and to be uh, recognized, one thing. But uh, if you are talking about the sort of, you know, quality of writing, there are always absolutely brilliant writers as well. But at the same time, uh, the, uh, you know, the climate in the country uh, is... Uh, forming the literature as well. Unfortunately, because of the dictatorship in Uzbekistan, the writers are usually writing in kind of metaphors, yeah, rather than an open text about, let's say, migration, about the uh, Islamic uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, feelings or appraisals or whatever, uh, development, and so on and so forth. So, uh, like in the Soviet Union, so everything should be between the lines rather than in the lines. So that is the biggest problem which I see with the, you know, with the modern Uzbek literature, that it's too sort of, uh, uh, you know, over metaphoric rather than sort of, you know, straightforward and uh, uh, sort of, you know, uh, raises the issues which are absolutely, uh, you know, issues which might be appealing to the rest of the world, might be appealing to the rest of the world. But luckily, we've got the taste for all kind of literature to be published and to be read. Some people, they love this kind of metaphorical uh, uh, literature. So there is the niche for them as well. So uh, that would be my answer about the uh, modern Uzbek literature. May I ask one more question? Um, you mentioned earlier in the talk some Turkestani literature from before the Russian conquest. I assume this is modern, like 19th century. Um, and I'm especially curious about the novel which you translated. Did this text call itself a novel? Or is this like how how did you decide to categorize it that way? And was it kind of was is the author Nishati? So is the author like aware of the European novel in some way, or you found yourself a mm -hmm. resonance mm -hmm. between these? Mm -hmm. Generally, the Central Asian literature, like uh, a sort of, you know, Persian and uh, especially Persian and Turkic literatures, they were written until the early 20th century in uh, poetic form, all of them. 
though you can easily call them novels, for example, yeah, for example, five novels of uh, uh, Navoi, for example, Hamsa, yeah, they are like novels, they are like, uh, let's say, uh, Evgeny Onegin, let's say, in uh, poetic form, but uh, there is a plot, there is a development, so all the elements of the novel, but yet they are written in a poetic form. So here it's up to us maybe to decide uh, could, uh, could we call them novels could we should we call them novels or should we just stay within the poetry and call them uh, poems so it's a sort of issue for uh, a specialist to de decide it you know how would you call for example i don't know could the, the milton's uh, lost uh, paradise let's say or could, i don't know the same divine comedy for example he called it comedy <laughs> yeah himself so sorry then um i was curious and maybe this was asked ahead of me as the gentleman, but um, I was wondering what effect um, the internet or self-publishing has had on this, on whether it's migrant literature, Central Asian literature, especially because I know here, in, at least in the States in the past five, 10 years, you have an enormous self-publishing boom. I'm wondering if, as opposed to going into a bookshop and getting, and you know, standard uh, brick and beam type thing, if the internet has had, um, what sort of effect it has had on this? Uh, talking, for example, for a sort of sedentary type literature, but generally, I can even generalize, I think, here. So generally, uh, the poets, they've used this opportunity. Yeah, because poetry is a sort of uh, digestible in uh, because you know internet. What the internet did us uh, to us? I mean, all these social uh, networks. Yeah, they've sort of uh, uh, shortened our attention span. Yeah, that is recognized by everyone. So poem is readable, still readable. If you put your novel, like I did, for example, on the Facebook uh, with Devil's Dance, yeah, so it might work, it might not work. Luckily, it worked in my case, yeah. Now I am publishing my latest novel on Telegram. I must say that I've got, for today, for example, when I published three chapters, yeah, I've got only 128 readers, nothing. Yeah, so that is the problem with the uh, with the with the with the sort of you know with the long forms, with the long forms. It might work. Maybe all of a sudden tomorrow I'll be having you know uh, you know two thousand or three thousand readers. I don't know, but uh, uh, poets they've used one thing. Secondly, those dissident writers who were abroad they're using it much more sort of effectively than those who are within the country. Within the country, there is this pressure of are you allowed to publish or not? How the authorities will be looking at you? Why you decided to go, for example, not the official route, yeah, but the social media route. There are all these pressures on the internal writers. So therefore, it has been developed uh, among the uh, outside writers much more. It's the way of, uh, it's not only me who is publishing his novels. I know several writers who are publishing their novels chapter by chapter and then putting the whole book on uh, line uh, abroad, from abroad. Um, you started your career as a video in the Soviet Union. I just wonder, do you consider this uh, system of multinational Soviet literature that, that existed, uh, um, you know, at least in its form of the 1980s, which you, which you got a, a, living, a living system producing uh, good literature? And could you have imagined, <laughs> I'm sorry, it's a very hypothetical question, but uh, could you have imagined having your literary life within within that system yeah. so my strategy during the soviet union was writing uh, what i uh, write uh, sort of you know somewhere else uh, into the drawer yeah but uh, uh, mostly translating no translation was allowed and you could have uh, sort of you know smuggled into uh, sort of you know uh, into the literary scene something uh, what you wanted to write let's say yeah for example i mean uh, uh 
talking about Uzbek literature, I uh, translated lots of French poetry, let's say, yeah? Uh, uh, French poetry, I translated Mandelstam, for example, as a creator of a new poetic language, yeah? Uh, uh, into Uzbek and so on and so forth. So that was the strategy, you know, to translate, but to write what you are writing into the drawer, you know, could, uh, hoping that one day you, I can't imagine what, what would have happened. I don't know, honestly. So it happened like uh, happened. I came to the West for three months, for example, to be absolutely honest, for three months. And I'm here for 30 years. Mm. Okay, we've got a couple more questions from the Zoom chat. Um... Galia says, thank you very much for this insightful talk. Are you on any social media? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. Yes, I am. Ismailov uh, underscore writer, Twitter, Facebook, uh, uh, Ismailov's literary page. Uh, so yeah, uh, on Telegram, on LinkedIn, <laughs> on every possible one. Thank you. I'll I'm putting this in the chat okay. for everyone. Okay, next question from the chat. Um, you seem to be using language as a proxy for diversity of experience or background, with the assumption that Anglophone audiences read more literature translated from French because French and English culture are relatively similar. But this seems to be a shaky assumption, particularly for colonial languages. A book written in French can be by a writer from metropolitan France, from Morocco, Senegal, Martinique, etc. Isn't this pro-diversity line of reasoning inadvertently erasing a great deal of difference? Uh, yes, that's true, absolutely true. So in many literatures, in, especially in post-colonial literatures, the first uh, sort of, you know, the first uh, uh, violin is usually a sort of, you know, uh, the colonial writers, the former colonial writers. Look, uh, uh, Leila Slimani, for example, in France, or uh, uh, Rahimi, Atik Rahimi, for example, one is from, uh, they are writing about their issues, uh, post-colonial issues, and they are becoming the voice of the modern literature, uh, uh, or in Britain, for example, uh, people like Z Zaidi Smith or uh, Monica Ali or many others, so, or, or Harry Kumsru, for example, so they're becoming the face, like uh, at the time, uh, people like Salman Rushdie was, uh, or uh, Tariq Ali and others were the uh, voices. The same is happening, by the way, in Russian literature as well. You know, Alisa Ganeva, for example, or Guzel Yakhina uh, are becoming the voices of the circuit, you know, because, because people need the diversity, you know, they, are, they need this diversity. Uh, there is a certain human need in diversity in uh, a sort of, you know, being able to understand and digest different experiences, not just your own. Uh, I very often remember, you know, for example, my uh, youth was completely in Tashkent was sort of, you know, within the American literature, you know. So we were reading only American writers, you know, could you name uh, Scott Fitzgerald, uh, Faulkner, uh, Thornton Wilder, uh, J J J Joyce Carol Rhodes, all of them, you know, I mean, uh, Steinbeck and all of them, basically, all of them, 20th century American writers. Once I was in the hospital, I was po uh, poisoned and next to me was an alcoholic, a Russian alcoholic, also poisoned by, by, by vodka. So, uh, and he was reading something and I looked, he was reading an American uh, author, an American author. I don't remember who was that, but uh, an American author whom I never read. Yeah, and I asked why you are reading this uh, author, and he said, uh, "But otherwise, what I am going to read? Pshenitsa, 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 which is uh, which in Russian means grain, 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 wheat, wheat, wheat. Why I should read uh, all this literature? So he was even this alcoholic was against the Soviet literature in a way uh, because he knew it by." his own experience this life, you know, uh, but he needed something else, uh, some otherness. So maybe that is the sort of, you know, our uh, zeal for otherness is giving the voices to those authors which you are saying. Why, for example, I'm trying to explain the sort of, you know, the phenomenon of Khaled Husseini. 
uh, because people they want to uh, uh, read in their own languages some strange experiences, someone else's experiences, some other uh, nations and ethnicities' experiences. Okay, one last question. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. One more question from the chat. Um, Mark and Gay asked, do you identify with Bulgakov? And then asked, because Mikhail Bulgakov fought with Stalin. <laughs> uh, could, uh, I mean, uh, all the canon of Russian books is uh, within me. Yeah, uh, could, uh, uh, I was could, uh, one of those who sort of, you know, uh, Sarah copied Master Margarita when uh, it first appeared, you know, and uh, cherished this book. You know, I was uh, uh, going to bed with it. I'm, I was waking up with it, and so on and so forth. Uh, so there are periods, you know, when you are interested in certain writers, uh, or for example, Begov Bulgakov, a classic thing, you know. Uh, I must say that uh, a friend of mine uh, gave me a nickname from the from the big. I won't be a sort of you know telling you the nickname, but he used to call me by the name of one of the characters of big of Bulgaka. But uh, it comes and it goes in a way. You know, you are interested in uh, other writers uh, more than. Uh, and you start to compare one to another and so on and so forth. So I don't want to sort of, you know, compare one writer to another, but uh, if you, for example, read uh, Platonov, uh, Andrei Platonov, you start to see, for example, how constructed is uh, Master and Margarita. You see the construction, the sort of, you know, engineering of it in a way. So uh, everything is interesting in comparison in a way, you know, because uh, let's say uh, Platonov is more organic in a way, but, uh, you never know where he goes. Whereas, for example, with Master and Margarita, you can predict where you are going next. So, but he was a part of me and he is a part of me. Uh, recently, someone, uh, you know, from the listening audience told me how similar is my devil dance to Master and Margarita. So maybe uh, you always sort of, as Bakhtin said, echoing someone somewhere. I myself recently discovered how uh, uh, Gaia or uh, Queen of Ants uh, sort of, you know, not similar, but in a way similar, maybe to uh, Fury and Sound of Faulkner. Here we are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was really fascinated by the theme of sort of openness in you know, openness to otherness in uh, in your lecture and. You know, you you started with this historical development and the sort of the contrast between the openness of earlier uh, Turkic uh, texts to you know to different religions to different um, ideas, and then the closure of literature is perhaps national closure in the Soviet period of you know Russians writing about Russians and so on. Um, in the first part of your talk, I thought you know openness really appeared as a cultural value in this way. Uh, in the second part of the talk, you talked about openness as a sort of very practical problem of the author as a question of, you know, how open, you know, different, how open societies are in material terms to, um, to otherness, right? And the, your, I love your comparison with the home office, right? That publishing works in a similar way. Uh, that is about who has the money, who has the access, you know, who can reach the readers. And I'm wondering, so openness is a cultural value on one side, uh, openness is a question of structures and resources and power on the other side. I mean, how do you relate these two, right? Does the, does the culture follow the structures or do you need, you know, can the culture produce new structures that sort of, could you comment on that relationship? I think they are, it's a wonderful question. I think they're interdependent, you know, what comes first as an idea then becomes a sort of, you know, your action in a way, you know? So uh, <laughs> we never, uh, 
first of all, we have to disclose yeah, the reality that uh, which is existing. Nobody cares about the sort of, you know, what happens in the publishing industry in a big way, yeah? That they are maybe even more racist and more closed than uh, the home office, for example, as I said, yeah? Home office at least gives the quarters, let's say, uh, whereas uh, the publishing houses, they don't give quarters. They are looking into say, selling figures only. And that's it. The only thing is selling figures, you know, the, will this author sell or not? That is the sort of, you know, the, uh, uh, their attitude. But if we change that one, you know, uh, in that sense, they are following the sort of, you know, the uh, presumptions of the societies. Will he sell? Because nobody cares about the otherness, let's say, yeah? So that is the thinking, the logic of thinking of the publisher. So he follows the taste of the society in a way, yeah? Then he suggests to this, but he is not sort of, you know, educating this society or whatever. He is not leading this society, uh, which he or she could have done, yeah? With a series of lectures, this and that, um, more exposure of these writers on television here, there as an industry. But it doesn't get to happen, you know. They are following the sort of, you know, the presumptions of the uh, of the uh, uh, society. So of uh, walks pop, basically, yeah. And uh, if you are not changing that one from one society, you won't be changing from another side. So they are quite interdependent, I think. Yeah. And it's a uh, uh, sort of uh, egg and chicken issue, you know, which you start first, for example, you know, uh, whether you are sort of, you know, changing your audiences, your societies to be more open and to be more acceptive and perceptive, and then uh, publishers follow them or publishers, they should proactively change the minds of their uh, readership. Luckily, I don't belong to <laughs> publishing the industry. You know. uh, I'm a customer of it. Yes. Okay, I think we have no more questions. So, I mean, thank you so much. This was a really illuminating, lovely talk. And thank you everyone who came both virtually and in person. And thank you for excellent questions. Thank you very much for your attention, for your patience, and for your participation.